Hi, welcome back to Coindesk Live. I'm Lee Quinn, Coindesk reporter, and I'm here with Yoni Asia of eToro, one of the founders. Thanks for joining us, Yoni. Thank you very much for having me. So Yoni's an OG. Yoni's been in the Bitcoin space since 2010. Um, now that we're kind of going into another cycle where the price of Bitcoin is rising, I'm wondering if you notice any similarities between previous cycles, especially the relationship between Bitcoin and different altcoins. So first of all, I, I think, you know, it's, it's very much also wishful thinking because mm -hmm. I hold Bitcoin, but I think we, have, we see very uh, large similarities between now and 2017, mm -hmm. right? We had this rise, then a correction, then during, I think, August 2017, uh, the ban of Bitcoin, where everybody was were really afraid of, of what's going to happen, and then the rally of Q417. So this is wishful thinking because it looks like that, um, and I think we haven't, we definitely have not seen a bubble yet. Mm -hmm. So so we've seen and experienced the crypto rally in Itoro, and what we've seen earlier this year uh, has nothing to do with it. So price, uh, sort of the uplift in price, matured the market, and sort of a lot of people who were already in the market came back in but there w wasn't sort of a, a, a rally or people, new people coming in yet. Hmm. So when I talked to some of the institutional traders, they talked to me about losing faith in some of their altcoin trades and really wanting to go back to Bitcoin. When you think about eToro and those retail traders and the wide diversity of traders across the platform, have you seen something that would be comparable to the alt season start of 2017, where we saw really significant gains in activity and community development around these niche assets? Or have we seen mostly Bitcoin starting to rise, but altcoins are sluggish and we don't see the retail traders picking those up? I, I think generally a lot of people were burnt from altcoins. Mm -hmm. uh, so people have experienced still, you know, 90% losses uh, and a lot are still recovering. Um, I think there is a difference between, let's say, the top 10 Mm -hmm. and sort of the rest of the altcoins and sort of the ICO party that we've experienced. I think there's still time before we potentially see, if we see, another true sort of altcoin, the, the wider bunch. Um, I, I think if you think about XRP and, and Ether, mm -hmm. I think generally their prices are relatively healthy. It's still... Uh, from a sort of correlation to Bitcoin, it's less than what it used to be. Mm -hmm. But I think everybody thinks today that Bitcoin is king, both from a brand perspective and everything else. Everybody understands Bitcoin is king, um, and the rest each have their own values, whether it's smart contracts and Ether or banking settlement with XRP, and I can go on and on. Gotcha. So as an OG, did you participate at all in the ICO boom? And if so, which are the ones that you're holding? Why do you believe in them, even though maybe the broader market uh, might have gone down in the price of that asset for temporarily? So uh, I, I was participating in the ICO market. I think I invested in like 20 or 25 ICOs. Um, my first ICO was actually, uh, back then they were called CoinDash. Uh, now uh, it's, it's, it's uh, Blocks. Um, and, and they were actually building a platform back then to monitor Ethereum addresses, so you'll be able to copy people who are investing in ICOs. And when they came to my room for the first time, I was like, explain to me exactly how does it work, this I I ICO thing? This was really late 16 or early 17. Uh, and, and our platform on eToro, the unique part of eToro, is you can see what everybody's trading mm -hmm. and you can copy top traders. Mm -hmm. So when we thought about suddenly utility coins or assets on the Ethereum network, and then people can actually see what everybody's trading on the Ethereum network, like in theory in a decentralized exchange, and you can copy the activity of top traders on Ethereum, that sounded super interesting, super relevant. So we went into the process together uh, with Blocks, still hold uh, uh, mm -hmm. some of the tokens there. Uh, we also, uh, I'm good friends with the Bancor team. Um, so I invested also in their previous startup, uh, and that was, I think, that was a, a pivotal ICO. This yeah. was May 2017, mm -hmm. um, and the reason is it was sort of the you know a large scale ICO that nobody expected suddenly to see 150 million dollar in an ICO, um, and, and and I think generally 
very good intent, very mm -hmm. smart things of what they're building. So still holding there as well. Um, humanic, I just love the concept of humanic. Um, uh, relates very much to what we're doing today with a good dollar. Mm -hmm. uh, so I do very much believe in blockchain for good. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, the, that currently the market I isn't healthy for, for social impact purposes. So if you think about inequality, which yeah. is a big problem in today's capitalist world, um, and obviously I'm a capitalist, mm -hmm. um, I, I think inequality constantly grows and, and that's an issue. Um, and I think in theory we'd want blockchain and crypto to improve uh, equality. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I think there are a lot of projects So we started the good dollar with the idea of creating a cryptocurrency where it's sort of social mining. So every person gets one good dollar a day mm -hmm. for life. So a, dollar, a good dollar a day keeps the banker away. So an open system where everybody can get free money and need to hack value into it, right? So we saw a lot of other projects in the space connecting between blockchain, smart contracts, and what some people would call universal basic income, is how do you distribute money to everybody? How do you truly uh, create financial inclusion? Uh, so that, that really resonated well when I read the original white paper of Humanic. Um, and then a lot of other ICOs, some have went well, some haven't. Uh, took me a while to realize that initial, you have like three days to sell everything to make the maximum amount of profit if you're in the short term. Um, but I think it was a very interesting experience. So um, you talked about Humanic's use case, and you talked a little bit also about uh, the various use cases from the ICOs you invested in. Your eToro is a cryptocurrency exchange, right? Like you have KYC, you sign up, people yeah. trade assets there. Bancor was a kind of exchange, like more of a liquidity platform. Do you feel that uh, there's still room in the marketplace for these variety of um, liquidity and exchange platforms, given the kind of regulatory clarity, not complete clarity, but slightly edging towards sure. more clarity we've seen? So, so we started eToro in 2007 with a vision of opening the global markets for everyone to trade and invest in a simple and transparent way. I started trading when I was 13. I love capital markets. I love investing in stocks. I love reading financial statements. I, I know I'm a finance geek. Mm -hmm. um, but the concept behind eToro was the fact that it's still relatively hard to, uh, to access traditional capital markets. Mm -hmm. If you want to trade now stocks in Japan or in Australia or in Hong Kong, you're going to find it expensive and hard. If you're in Europe or in Australia trying to trade US stocks, you're going to find it a bad user experience, expensive, uh, and, and that's why we started eToro. We wanted to build a platform which creates access to more people to basically invest in what they believe in. Mm -hmm. And the unique part of what we did was the social trading element where everybody can see what everybody's trading mm -hmm. and you can copy the top traders on the platform. Now, what we are, th there are two separate sort of revolutions happening, mm -hmm. connecting to the same thing, which is a generational transformation of wealth. Um, for the next 30 years, every year about a trillion dollars are going to move from older generations, which are other, either our parents or grandparents, uh, to our generation or our kids' generation. And user expectations are very, very different. They expect a social, mobile experience, which is real time. They expect to do everything through their phone without talking to anyone. Um, and they ex expect everything to be global so so when they meet people from other places they expect to talk about the same things um, like everything we do in tech and that process of the democratization of wealth management is actually uh, somewhat the other side of what we're seeing in blockchain and crypto because crypto is just a native digital asset it's suddenly an asset where everywhere i travel uh, and and I, I've been to a couple of dozen of countries in the past couple of years. People know what Bitcoin is. They can talk about Bitcoin. They can hold Bitcoin. They can trade Bitcoin. There are local exchanges almost in every country today in the world. Uh, so Bitcoin actually became almost more accessible than most capital markets in the world, right? But those are two separate things that are happening which are still much, much bigger than people realize because there is $140 trillion of assets under management and they're all going to move to people who expect to manage their assets 
through online mobile real-time platforms and probably based on blockchain and digital assets. Gotcha. So when you think about eToro and those social features that you guys have, have you noticed any um, niche cryptos rise through the ranks based on the strength of that community, of the social interaction, or is it more primarily related to the market value when you see the smaller ones falling away and then the stronger ones rising? So I think, f first of all, what we see in the platform, which is quite interesting, um, we have uh, 11 million users from 130 countries. So a lot of times we see sort of something happening in one geography then spreading to another geography. Mm -hmm. So the platform is in 24 different languages. So we operate in China and Australia and, and Philippines and, Tha and uh, Thailand and all the European countries. Um, and what we a lot of times see is something starts in Asia, then traveling to the US, then going into Europe from like a traction point of view. Um, and I think that's something that we've seen with XRP, where the strength of the community always surprises me, mm -hmm. sort of how the strength of the crypto community on crypto Twitter on XRP resonated very, very strongly on the, on the Toro platform where I think in 2017 we were one of the very few places where you could actually buy with Fiat XRP. So you sound like you're very bullish across the entire space. Is there anything that you think can make a, an asset fail, make a project fail? I, I, well, I'm not necessarily bullish across all altcoins. That, that won't mm -hmm. be a smart thing to do. Um, I, I'm very bullish about the future of Bitcoin. Mm as an asset, and I would generally say that, that the top ones, I understand why they're the top ones. I love the concept of smart contracts. I don't mm -hmm. think we've seen the killer app yet in decentralized smart contracts. Um, I think the big problem with altcoins in general is a moral hazard problem. Um, I think capital markets and, and fundraising is problematic and I've done that. We've raised $162 million in eToro, so I understand fundraising. And as an entrepreneur, it's a really hard, inefficient process. You actually constantly walk around meetings, pitch your story face to face. Yeah. Um, and it seemed like ICOs were relatively a very good solution to sort of pitch your idea in the internet and have thousands or tens of thousands of people suddenly invest uh, in your idea. But also as an entrepreneur who've raised money from the largest financial institutions in the world, I do understand and involved very much in capital markets, corporate governance is very important. And there's a reason why there's structures like board and corporate governance and remuneration committees and risk committees and audit committees and why companies need to have audited financial statements and, and a lot of that regulation goes obviously into both public markets, but also in private markets wh when VCs invest. And that is to keep everyone sort of interests relatively aligned. And I think what we're seeing, what, we're, what we have seen in the crypto industry is a moral hazard where people raise money and because they don't have those controls in place, don't necessarily use the money for the purposes that the investors would have wanted them to use the money for. Mm -hmm. um, and, and without corporate governance or regulation, uh, which could be the same thing or separate things, th that could create a big problem, which some people would call that fraud, some people would call that just bad behavior. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we've, we've seen a lot of that. We've seen a lot of scams in the crypto industry. So it sounds to me what you're saying is, is that trust from the community and keeping a relationship with that community of token holders, token users, is something that will distinguish altcoins that can succeed in the long term versus those that um, will fall away because they'll lose the trust in the market. You, you need, for a utility coin, and there's an argument if such a thing still exists, for a utility coin to truly work, the founders need to be super committed to stay on course and support that utility and that utility token and, and not diverge their attention. Because once they diverge, and that's very hard by the way, and not necessarily the right thing for most companies, right? Because companies, a lot of VCs, when they invest in a company, 
they actually want the company to pivot if the course they're on isn't the right course. Mm -hmm. They would push them to pivot, right? Mm -hmm. But if you created a utility token with a certain defined utility and then you pivot, that utility disappears mm -hmm. and, and then it's very hard to sort of pivot something new into that utility. Mm -hmm. And then in a lot of cases, it becomes very artificial. Gotcha. So far in 2019, have you noticed in eToro any newcomers or uh, maybe assets that weren't getting as much attention before rising up through the ranks? Did it surprise you? Or has it pretty much been the same? I, I think so. On the eToro platform itself, uh, we have uh, 15 of the uh, crypt top 20 cryptocurrencies trading. So the mm -hmm. highest volume ones, again, the eToro trading platform, you can trade stocks along s from 15 different exchanges alongside cryptocurrencies. Uh, we've also launched eToro X, which is our exchange, where we launched our own 12 different stable coins. Uh, so there, what we're seeing is some interest uh, in basically sort of pairs that don't traditionally trade like, you know, XRP Australian dollar and XRP New Zealand dollar mm -hmm. uh, or uh, XRP gold or uh, Litecoin gold, sort of stuff that are more uh, sort of connecting, bridging between the old world of finance, which are traditional fiats uh, and traditional commodities into the world of crypto. Mm -hmm. so, so that is something we are seeing. And uh, I think we're generally also seeing more usage uh, through the blockchain wallet, uh, more usage people actually sort of starting to send and receive more crypto assets between them and their friends. So you mentioned that you've been through a few cycles before and that in some ways there's some patterns in terms of there's a lot of excitement, lots of things try, some things work, some things don't. Um, is there anything that you're noticing in terms of what kinds of things people are trying or um, what patterns people are doing uh, with this current market cycle versus other cycles that you've experienced? There's, I think there's four big cycles that we've seen. Uh, there, there's Mount Gox cycle, uh, which was right when we launched Bitcoin on, on eToro. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously the 2017 cycle. I think right now we're sort of in an awakening phase. Mm -hmm. um, so people who were interested in buying, so you're seeing a couple of things. First of all, all of the people who are into crypto, myself included, are now at the point of saying, damn, I had to buy more Bitcoin at 3,500. Mm -hmm. And why didn't they buy Ether at $90? Because it sort of seemed obvious we'll get out of that, right? That was three months ago. Um, but but, but it was very, it's very hard to make decisions, those decisions, when there's blood on the street. And that was sort of the peak of, of that crypto winter, um, peak or bottom. Um, and, and I think now, first of all, you see a lot of the crypto people starting to pile up. So when there's a correction downstream, saying, okay, I'll buy some more. Um, the more trading oriented ones would also now start to sell high. So we're seeing, I think that the monthly active users in eToro doubled in the mm. past six months because people just log in more every day. Uh, I think the daily active even more, more than doubled because simply people who hold crypto, all of the hodlers that we have in eToro suddenly are just logging in every day. Mm. So, so, that's def so we're, we're seeing a lot of interest from the people who already had interest or some interest before. Gotcha. Do you see any difference in patterns of behavior related to Bitcoin uh, versus like 2017 and other cycles where we saw the price uh, slowly starting to rise? People buying more, people buying smaller amounts more regularly. Um, any kind of difference in the type of demographic that might be interested? Well, throughout the sort of the crypto winter, what we did monitor is the number of units held by our users. Mm. Um, and, and that actually surprised us quite a bit because it was relatively stable. So a lot of our clients hold uh, a Bitcoin, Ether, XRP, um, and the amount of units on the platform, though the value went down, obviously, the amount of units actually st stayed almost the same. So people were truly hodling 
throughout crypto winter. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've seen, we actually did an ad with Hoder from yeah. Game of Thrones. About that. that was the right time, like because everybody, the hodlers were already getting almost to a point where, where, where they were giving up. So we gave them some humor. Um, but what we saw on the platform is really a lot of the people uh, basically not capitulate and, and sort of huddle and now they're becoming more active. They're buying and selling, sort of trading a bit of their assets. Gotcha, so people are um, returning to the kind of trading activity that we saw. Th that we saw in 2017. Still, by the way, not the, not the peak. We're, we're far from the peak from what we're seeing. We, we're seeing, it's again from our internal data, mm -hmm. when we look at the number of new funded accounts, new activity, mm -hmm. new registrations, we're seeing something very similar if you compare this to sort of Q1 and Q2 2017. Mm -hmm. Again, just a disclaimer, this might be wishful thinking, meddling with facts. Fair, very fair. But then right after that Q1 2017, we saw this proliferation of new assets. Do you think we're about to go right. into a period where we have a proliferation of new assets or the assets that are already out there existing are going to either rise up or, or crash in this market? I, I think that at least right now, so first of all, we're, we are seeing some revival, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a bit different. We're seeing it instead of ICOs, we're seeing IEOs. Um, yes. and, IEO, and the difference is, in theory, IEOs uh, are, are more governed. And, and I think that's the biggest disappointment people had from ICOs mm -hmm. is getting into an ICO which is a scam mm -hmm. or getting into an ICO where the team left. Uh, so, you know, investing in something that goes kaput completely, like, mm. that really kills your appetite to invest <laughs> in more ICOs. I think IOs are a bit better because you have someone um, saying, I did some due diligence and this seems legit. Do they have the power to govern it in case it doesn't go through? I'm not certain. Um, so I, I have to say I haven't participated yet in any IEOs. Mm. Um, and why is that since you were so into the ICOs? It, again, I think bec because at the end of that cycle, uh, I, I realized it's a bit getting carried away with very high risk assets. Mm -hmm. um, I consider Bitcoin high risk. So if you think Bitcoin is high risk, ICOs are, are like on, on the extreme of high risk, again, mm -hmm. compared to, remember, stocks, yeah. when you take, talk to people here in Wall Street, stocks uh, are sort of medium to high risk, right? Okay. They think fixed income is, is that, that's okay risk. Um, so so I, I just, you know, ended the, the cycle of ICOs um, with a bit of a feeling, uh, you know, that risk was too high we, for you. We, go, we got a bit carried away in the process there, um, where you had to go into something, you didn't have the time to read the white paper, there was a lot of pressure to go into something. Um, and I think IEOs are, are really, by the way, capturing that same FOMO, creating mm -hmm. that process where people don't necessarily have enough time to really understand. But, but I, I think it's, it, it's a step up. It's a step up because there's more governance, there's more due diligence, there's more process, the sums are lower, uh, so potentially high, higher sort of upside. So I'm looking at the space. Um, I just think it's, it's going to take a bit more time. I think that part plus tokenized securities are, are both super interesting and again, again tapping to the, the same problem. And the problem is it's very hard, you know, it's too hard for entrepreneurs to raise funds probably, proper, uh, properly on a global scale, yes. um, especially if you know if you, if you were born in the Valley or here, uh, to some extent in Tel Aviv in London, it, you might be fine. But but for a lot of entrepreneurs, um, where there isn't a, a healthy enough sort of venture capital ecosystem, an angel ecosystem, uh, then I, I think it's a it's a great opportunity for capital formation. Gotcha. So, but 2017 did happen, right? And since then, we have seen some increase in the attention that we're getting from the government. 
uh, from both regulators and from leaders like Trump, who you know recently tweeted about Bitcoin. How do you think that that slightly different climate will impact this next cycle of prices and experimentation? So first of all, I think, as I mentioned before, it's a part of a very of a, of a bigger macro thing, which is who has the right to print money. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and that's, you know, that's, we can talk for hours about that. One of the reasons that I love the crypto community is you can talk to people about, you know, philosophy and economics and at the same time about that implementation of those economics formulas in, in, in you know, computer science code, mm -hmm. um, w which didn't really exist 15 years ago or, or even 10 years ago. Um, so we're looking at four very big forces uh, one is governments uh, who have generally a monopoly on printing money um, and on collecting tax. Uh, and we have banks uh, who got the right to digitize money from governments a long time ago. Uh, so my, my, f my grandfather actually uh, uh, built a bank, founded a bank, uh, and he used to run a bank before there were computers. So Which this. Bank? Um, it became uh, the Israeli, I think it's fourth or fifth now bank, it's uh, uh, First International Bank, Phoebe. Cool. Um, and, and when they were banking back there, um, there was both a lot of fraud, mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 they didn't, and the blocks were basically these ledgers that went on, on sort of on, on taxis every day mm -hmm. to the central br branch. But since then, with computers, everything was digitized, and the digitization of money actually is in the hands of banks, right? The, they're the only ones with access to central banks, mm -hmm. and they're responsible for the digitization of money, which is basically what the crypto and blockchain community is all about. Yes. Um, the third is the crypto community, which are generally, you know, uh, crypto punks, hackers, yeah. right? Uh, a lot of us are libertarians. Uh, we believe that people should have access uh, to money, that access to money should be a free thing, mm -hmm. uh, that ev anyone should have the right to open an account and to send money to whoever he wants. Um, and, 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 and that is sort of the heart of the crypto movement. And now suddenly the fourth player emerged, which are the Facebooks and the Googles and the Amazons uh, of the world, mm -hmm. the tech giants who are now coming into play. And, and this entire play is around the definition of money, who has the right to print money, uh, and, and, and what is money from a product and technology point of view. Because money is just another product that we humans invented, and if you measure it by how many people, how many mouths and DAOs, monthly active users and daily active users, does money have in the world, you'll find out it's the best product we've ever invented. Sure. I mean, a lot of people use money, but a lot of people also live on credit, right? As credit is a, is a for, is still a form of money. It's a form of money. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's basically a derivative of money, right? Mm -hmm. um, so credit would be in dollars uh, or, you know, or euros or, or yens. Um, it's, it's how the ecosystem in its entirety is built. There's $60 trillion, I think, of debt right yeah. now in the world. Um, so you could argue that all money is credit. Yes, uh, you um, And I think we're going to see a change in the definition of money. There, there is a, there is a, that tectonic shift of who prints money, how money is being inflated, uh, how it's being run, who regulates it. Uh, we're going to see a very big change. It's, I'm not 100% sure who's going to win. Uh, in, or who's going to sort of partner. I, I was actually, I, I thought Libra I, I is a great step forward. Um, I, I think when I read the white paper of Libra, um, so it's, it's very inspiring. It talks about the right things, about financial inclusion, about enabling people uh, to move assets easily from one place to another. I can tell you that at Etoro we have, you know, a lot of money flowing in from a hundred different countries, and it's vi it's vi it's challenging. It, the rails 
the rails of moving money overseas do not work properly today. Mm. Um, so I do understand the purpose of Libra, very well written. I'm surprised that while it started in the first couple of weeks to have very good feedback, um, I'm surprised how it at least seems that turned relatively quickly uh, into something that seems like regulators uh, are, are trying to, resi to resist it, although, mm -hmm. again, it's sensible, uh, but at least they can talk to someone. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think maybe um, some government authorities uh, don't appreciate the fact that with Facebook and Libra, they have someone to talk to uh, because they can't talk to anybody in Bitcoin. Would eTaro ever consider joining the Libra, uh, Libra Association? Definitely. Um, so that sounds like a, a very controversial, but also even keeled opinion. If we think about the broader marketplace, is there any other unpopular opinion you have that you think um, about what's good for the space, what's, what will progress the space forward? So I, I started originally, obviously, as, as all people who started early in, in crypto uh, as a Bitcoin maximalist. Mm. Um, so when, when Vitalik worked with us on the Colored Coins paper and told uh, me that he wanted to build a new blockchain, I said, that why would anybody ever need another blockchain? That's silly. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we tried to build tokens, tokenized assets. The same thing we're doing, by, by the way, now on Ethereum. We tried to do in 2012 on Bitcoin. Um, I think nobody's done that yet properly. Um, and because I was in that eco chamber, because all my friends were also people who were in Bitcoin since 2011, 12. Uh, so when uh, Vitalik started working on Ethereum, my entire eco chamber were like, that, that doesn't, that can't work. Mm -hmm. um, and after it launched. Mm -hmm. Um, and I got, w was probably one of the first people to got the white paper, send it to a lot of people. The entire maximalist sort of said, completely dismissed it. After it launched, we were still working on colored coins, right? So it's sort of competing colored coins and Ethereum back then. Um, and everybody constantly explained to me why it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And at some point, I'm like, okay, let, let me work with it a bit to figure out how do you, why do you say it's not working? I can actually see it working. And I started moving assets and I'm like, but it, it's working. But the eco chamber was so certain that it doesn't work mm. that, that it, it made it very hard to consider investing in it early enough. So well, it really depends what's early enough because we listed it on eToro when it was like six or eight dollars. Really? So it's still early. Uh, yeah. But it's not early enough, like 40 cents or dollar where it should be. Um, but my conclusion from that was not to dismiss what potentially could work. Um, and don't assume that because something isn't what you currently believe in, whether it's, by the way, whether it's Bitcoin, which has its own, you know, gravitas of being the digital gold and store of value or whether it's capital markets and you're talking uh, and I have very similar arguments so Bitcoin maximalists are very similar to value investing maximalists who hmm. only look at DCF don't believe in in growth stocks or stocks that lose money I, I think there is a place for everything and anything and and you just need to understand what's your, your what's your risk appetite so you just said something really interesting that it, um, Ethereum works so Ethereum is, um, unlike Bitcoin, which is about sending a form of value from one point to another, Ethereum is the idea that you can build this form of value to automate things, smart contracts, to have it do things automatically with relation to that transaction. And I feel like uh, we see with ETH 2.0, there's a lot of things that still need to be done in order to have that automation factor work across the board. Um, you mentioned debt being a form of money. In some ways, I guess we could think about tokens as a kind of debt in terms of the, the promise, the potential that it could be, it's a representative of yeah. that debt. So when do you think to yourself, okay, this project maybe has not achieved everything that it could achieve, but it has proven to me that it can achieve something? Because that something may not be, like in Ether's case, the full um, 
I'm, I'm working I'm, East 2.0. That also might be an unpopular opinion, though I don't know why. But but I'm I'm still a very big fan of Vitalik. Yeah. I think he's one of the smartest people. I would exaggerate if I wouldn't say not even in the industry, like a w on a wider scale. Um, so having sort of worked with Vitalik, see how Vitalik thinks, um, that is a brilliant mind. N now, where Ethereum is today, I think Ethereum achieved more than most uh, cryptos yes, uh, from a sure. usage point of view. Yes. Um, so personally, I've used Ethereum as a blockchain more than any other asset, but by far, gotcha. uh, just because you know I have MetaMask, uh, I traded decentralized exchanges, I used to trade on Ether Delta before uh, it got sort of bust or whatever. I traded on on at least four other decentralized exchanges. I bought Crypto Kitties, so I did a lot of you could say silly things with Ethereum, but I used a blockchain uh, and, and I was excited to use smart contracts um, for the first time and second time and third time, as I was excited to see Bitcoin works for the first time and using Satoshi Dice on the blockchain.info for the first time, where you start, where you interact with money, mm -hmm with these systems which are decentralized and things just work. Yeah. A a and if you come from financial services and you understand how much the system doesn't work mm -hmm. and is not automated, mm -hmm. it's just a beautiful thing as a, as a computer geek to, to experience. So I think, I definitely think there is a lot of value for smart contracts. I think it hasn't been found, it hasn't been utilized yet. Mm -hmm. And I think there are a lot of regulatory uncertainties around smart contracts but again having coming from traditional capital markets derivatives financial engineering the idea of writing things in code and for code to actually automate transfers between people based on predefined rules um, and, and that it has access to all of our wallets and you can create sort of basically any any super derivative that you want to create in code um, I think that's super useful, but for that to be useful, you have to have assets connected to the blockchain. So again, eventually, our, our view is we're going to see trillions of dollars moving into the blockchain, dollars and euros and yens and pounds and, and silver and gold and stocks. Once traditional assets are on the blockchain, you could transform a lot of what's happening today here in Wall Street uh, on, you know, on, on these 250 pages the contracts um, and, and, and sort of you know with a lot of bankers and lawyers and accountants involved you can transform everything into code uh, which is which works which is auditable uh, um, and, and, and potentially uh, sort of unchangeable right so immutable gotcha so I want to ask one last question before I let you go today, and that's what can we expect to see from eToro over the next six months? Would you guys be interested in expanding the diversity of assets on the platform? And if so, what are you prioritizing? So first of all, we're super excited about launching in the US. Yeah. It's still really, really early time for us in the US. Uh, we launched uh, three and a half months ago. We've seen um, last three months 50 to 100 percent growth every uh, every month, or we just opened a couple of more states, or we just opened Florida, we opened Texas, we're doing launch events everywhere. So launching in the U.S. is super exciting. So I, I founded eToro 12 years ago, I'm getting older, <laughs> um, and it took me 12 years uh, 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 to get to, uh, to America. Um, so very much like Eddie Murphy and coming to America. <laughs> um, so so I, I think that's definitely the most exciting thing we're doing right now. Um, and we plan on uh, adding stocks to the trading platform uh, soon uh, and uh, adding more assets uh, into both a trading platform where you can trade basically crypto assets, move them into the wallet and then pay and receive uh, payments with crypto assets uh, as well as launching more uh, both a copy trader and copy portfolios here uh, both in the US and globally, which enables people with a click of a button basically to get managed portfolios, both in crypto or in the combination 
of crypto and stocks. Um, so we, well, we love financial geeks uh, who want to actively trade. We still, the, we, we, we understand the bigger markets aren't traders. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole idea of social trading. You can go into eToro, you can see th now even thousands of people from the US or hundreds of thousands of people globally you see their track record. Uh, and if you're not a trader, you don't want to actively decide every day what to buy and what to sell. You just copy someone with $1,000 uh, and tracks its activity automatically. So I think that's a, a huge potential here in the US and very excited to sort of gradually La launch and learn. Well, we're glad to welcome you to the market here. And thank you so much, Ernie, for coming to join us today. Thank you very much. Happy to come again. Awesome. So if you're still joining us with Coindesk Live, next we'll be talking about NEM. And uh, this was Yoni Asya of eToro. Thank you very much. <laughs>